a Norwegian author and well-known worldwide for six autobiographical novels titled *My Struggle* and multiple prize winner. Karlovi Knausgaard has been described as one of the 21st century's greatest literary sensations. Thank you for tuning in to the Global Novel. I'm Claire Hennessy. With me today is our returning guest speaker, Dr. Bob Blaisdell. As I've introduced him on the show before, he is professor of English at City University of New York's Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn. He is author of *Creating Anna Karenina*, *Tolstoy*, and *The Birth of Literature's Most Enigmatic Heroine*, and another book titled *Chekhov Becomes Chekhov: The Emergence of a Literary Genius*. <laughs> Hi, Bob. Welcome back to the show, and happy holidays. Hi, Claire. Thank you very much. Happy holidays to you too. Well, first of all, congratulations on your new publication titled "A Conversation with Karlov V. Knausgaard," published by the、uh, University Press of Mississippi this year. Interestingly, when UP Mississippi recommended you to be our on a show, and I was like, "Wait a minute! I know this scholar. We actually interviewed him before on Tolstoy." So I know, Bob, you are enthusiastic about Tolstoy's work, particularly his autobiographical aspect in fiction. Our previous chat about Tolstoy's creative struggles while writing An- *Anna Karenina* was was fascinating and enlightening. You've often mentioned, I remember in the show, that Tolstoy's influence on writers and the writer's block concept, right? And now,、yeah. connecting Tolstoy to Knausgaard, both have this. This kind of captivating way of of turning life's ordinary moments into something compelling with their eloquent writing style. So, why Knausgaard this time? What draws you to recommend Knausgaard to our listeners, your students, friends, or colleagues? And what makes his writing stand out for you, especially in comparison to to Tolstoy's works? I'll start with Knausgaard. Being for me a way for 21st century literature to come alive again.、Um, I, I read a lot of 21st century literature. Most of the literature I, I read, I admit, is 19th century, and I've read most 20th century authors, most famous 20th century authors. But for the 21st century,、um, there was nobody in fiction that I was that I had to read. I felt like I had to read besides、uh, Juno Diaz,、um, the American Dominican writer, and、uh, Carlo V. Knausgaard brought me back into the excitement that I think 19th century readers would have had as Tolstoy was writing his novels, as Chekhov publishing his stories.、Uh, what he was doing was com- completely different from anything. Else, anybody、uh, this century has done.、Uh, he created a lot of excitement, and he didn't. He he didn't imagine. Knausgaard did not imagine that this experiment, this this my struggle, autobiographical fiction,、um, would be a hit. He thought it would be a very niche publication in his native Norway, but because it's so personal. Uh, because he used, for the most part, everyone's real name, including his own, there was there was excitement in Norway before the publication, and he thought, "Uh oh, this is going to have a lot of readers." And it, I don't know, it, I I think in Norway, it was something like ten percent of all readers in Norway was reading his book. And it got published. It got、uh, translated within the next two or three years into English and other European languages, and it continued to just excite the world. He thinks it was very fluky, accidental.、Uh, it wasn't his ambition to write a world famous novel. And I, I came to the novels a little late. I started reading the essays. The short essays in the seasons series, and those led me to the 3,600 pages of my struggle. Tell us about Knausgaard himself. If you were to introduce him to our listeners who haven't read him yet, how would you describe his ability to transform his own life into art? 
and especially how does he craft his personal experiences into works of artistry that resonate with readers? You're, you're right eh? that he turns he turns what seems like just ordinary life, and that's what he's saying. His his ordinary life, um, being a a son, being a brother, being a husband, being a father. Um, he doesn't seem to exclude any part of his life, and yet he turns ordinary, our everyday life, getting up to make breakfast for the kids, um, and it's seeming to be un, uh, unselected. Like this is not like a special, a special moment. It's just a one moment, one day, where he's making breakfast, um, one day where he's dropping the kids off, one day where he's bringing one child to a library sing-along for other two-year-olds. So to relate it back to Tolstoy, Tolstoy makes made for me as a young man realize that anything could be written about, anything could be the basis of literature with a kind of focus. And painters make us feel like that, make me feel like that too. It's like, why is this image of a woman pouring milk so captivating? Why does it make me feel like it's worth being alive? Uh, and Karlovi describing, in some way, it is like a painter. And that even, even when the portraits are, are self-portraits, he's not really interested in in himself. He's interested in this is what a person is. Uh, this is what is this what life is. So it's not a it's not a memoir. It's not about what I remember and what's important to me. It's some way, just using what he had available to him, and all the barriers that he had as an artist, as a as a novelist, because uh, he had long stretches where he couldn't write, years where he could not. Writing was so important to him, and uh, he he get himself time and place to write. He went out to an island shortly after his first child was born. He spent I don't know two months alone on an island. His wife is wondering what the hell we just had a baby, but writing was so important to him. He's out on he's out on this island with two other three other people on the island, and um, he couldn't write. And he said it was only when he started this experiment and he decided not to exclude anything, even if he was writing about his father and his childhood, even if he was writing about how he and his wife fell in love. The present day, he, if the present day intruded on the writing, the present day was part of the writing. And that was, that was revelatory and exciting for me and seemed distinctive. Right. I really like the metaphor that you use to compare his writing to a kind of self-portrait. And I think that really captures well the essence of his creativity. And also what I, from what I've heard about what you just said is more of an existentialist description of life or transformation of ordinary life to art. Speaking of which, you also mentioned a lot of uh, characters remained the same. Uh, he didn't change the names whatsoever. And I also read elsewhere, and especially from your book, that he was actually uh, getting sued, you know, by his family members. He, he met lots of backlashes. So uh, could you say more about that? Sure. So when the first, the first volume of my struggle um, is about the death of his father. Um, and um, his father had a a messy, unhappy, uh, very what Karlovy sometimes calls it a slow suicide, where he just drank himself to death. Um, and Karlovy's uh, uncle, his father's brother, uh, did not like the, read read the novel before it was published and threatened the publisher that he was going to sue them. And um, the, the death was not like that. And Karlove accepted that, well, 
maybe it wasn't like that, but that's what I, exactly that's what I remember as I recreate it. And it turns out uh, later, Karlovy got confirmation from like the, the paramedics who came, um, the people who helped uh, out, outsiders who who witnessed the death or uh, confirmed the death that it was just as he had said, or worse. So Karlovy's uncle and other family members, some of them don't talk to him anymore. But it's his life, and it, it was his life transformed into art, his life transformed into a novel. It, it brought up questions about, well, would you want your whole life discussed? That was the material of his life. And after all, he came off uh, he thought worse than anybody. There's nothing, he, he wasn't trying to make points, score points off anybody. He was just, again, using his life as literary artistic material. So this, despite the controversy, despite the threatened lawsuits, that none of the lawsuits resulted in anything. And as with a lot of controversies, it just made it more interesting for people to go or people were more curious about with uncle's protest inspired uh, more book selling. Why do you believe Gnaskar's novels have garnered such wide acclaim? I mean, apart from what you just talk about from being publicized through his uncle inadvertently, are there specific historical or cultural circumstances that have contributed to his meteoric rise as a literary figure? Or do you think the resonance of his themes aligns with the desires of readers in various markets? And that's a good question and, and very complicated. So I'll, I'll start with the simplest part, uh, which is, which is, uh, I think uh, there are many, there's many been in his literary history and artistic history, there's been undiscovered in their lifetime. The, the artist wasn't discovered, he wasn't appreciated, the writer wasn't appreciated. I think uh, his, his material in my struggle was so extraordinary, so, so brilliant that it couldn't be suppressed. It was just, he thinks it's fluky. He thinks he doesn't understand why and how it happened. He, he thinks it's just a kind of accident. But I, I think with certain kind of artistic talent, uh, Mozart and Tolstoy, Cezanne, uh, it just comes out that it's recognized in its own time. And he was recognized at this time when really I, I, for one, and I think many people who are devoted to reading, had given up on that there was going to be anything new in 21st century literature. There was just going to be good, good material. This was something completely different, powerful, and uncontainable. So I think it took the world by fire because the world hadn't seen anything like this. Right. And I know you are a short story writer. So which parts of the novel left a profound impression on you resonating deeply either in your role as a writer or as an avid reader? I think, it, I think it's the endlessness of everyday life. I, th I think it brought back everyday life. Our appreciate, it brought back for me the, my appreciation of how special everyday life is on reflection, recollection. Again, in, in the same way as, as Tolstoy made me feel like, even though this is very particular people who I don't know in a different time and place, his people are in some time in recollection, but often of the, the very moment, but they're living in a different country, different circumstances. They seem very familiar. So making these remote places and events seem as ordinary and familiar as my own life. He, he sometimes talks about just uh, being a 16-year-old boy, and that's the focus of maybe the third volume, the 16-year-old Carl Ove, is, uh, is very similar to a 16-year-old's experience in Chile, a 16-year-old experience in Korea, a 16-year-old boy's experience in Afghanistan. There's 16-year-old boyness, which is part of what he's getting at, and I think 
that readers have responded to. And even though he is who he is, uh, women have responded just as strongly to He's been accused of being kind of super masculine, but he, he wonders about that because so much of what he's revealed about himself and understood about himself shows his, his also his feminine side, his, his peculiar vulnerabilities, you know, the, the boy who cried, his taste for fashion. He's very fashionable. He, he doesn't think of himself as manly. He's embarrassed by unmanliness. He's seen as a particularly manly figure. He's very, he's very handsome. He's very personable. In the interviews, it's you do take in his physical presence, even just on for me on Zoom when I talk to him. He's had the biggest influence on my writing. I'm embarrassed and also grateful for how he's opened up parts of writing to me where I couldn't get free of a kind of fictional voice and. Through reading his my struggle, I think I figured out how to get away from false the false voice or the voice that I immediately recognized was not to where I wanted it. Um, uh, there was just this fictional uh, haze over everything. He talks about well, one thing he, he repeatedly talks about is the writing. He doesn't. He did, he's not somebody who rereads his own work and appreciates it. But he is someone who, once he found his way of writing with my struggle after its first two novels, he pushed speed so that he wouldn't block himself. He was so self-critical that the only way he could get past his self-critical mind that made him worry about phrases and words was to go really fast. To, to write at least 10 pages a day. And if he had to write 20 pages, he would write 20 pages a day to finish. Uh, so I interviewed him twice while he was working on his latest series of novels, which are fictional, deliberately fictional, and not as, not as interesting to me, but uh, it's important. it was important for him, I think, to show himself that he could he could make things up, um, that he could use a different canvas than his own life. Um, but he would he would write 10 to 20 to 30 pages a day because he had to finish the 800 pages in a year and to write fast. And um, I'd already known or felt something like that as a writer, that for some reason things went better when I didn't hesitate. When I just ran forward and saw and let things happen as they happen, um, so I'm grateful to him for opening that to me and showing me that it, it does work. An effective way around writer's block is to go really fast. Well, tell us about Kanaskar's other notable works, particularly the uh, post My Struggle Seasons Quartet of short essays and literary experiments. How would you characterize these essays overall, and what specific elements or qualities stood out to you and captured your attention? So it's, um, he wrote he wrote four books, uh, starting in 2014 and maybe finishing in 2015. Um, autumn, winter, spring, and summer. And uh, the first two are very similar. Uh, autumn and winter are, they each have about 50 short essays about one specific topic from uh, a body part, lips, to fingers, um, to household objects. Kleenex, Q-tips, to food, eggs, and he's in the mode of he just has to write for about a thousand words, whatever occurs to him, whatever he knows about these particular objects, and they become alive. It's again a, an experiment of everything is of interest, everything is alive as we give it life and an interest. 
and sometimes it's the most uh, mundane items in our life that frees him up to make associations and uh, frees up memories. Um, he writes an essay about adders, which are a poisonous snake in, in Scandinavia. And that leads him to a terrible memory of his father killing a non-threatening adder. If you have enjoyed listening to this episode so far and want to hear the entire episode, you can subscribe at theglobalnovel.com slash subscribe. Thank you so much for listening.